G'day, I'm Jason Edwards. Welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. And I'm Maddie Claire Sloan. Jace, you've been busy this year. What have you been up to? Well, I've been travelling around the country shooting some great locations, road testing some gear, and catching up with photographer friends of mine. What about you, Maddie? I've been catching up with some of Australia's best photographers. It's been fascinating, to say the least. Now, where are you taking us this week? I've just been in the top end, and I caught up with this big fella. Great shot, Jace. I'm glad you made it back in one piece. <laughs> Let's go there and take a look. We've just touched down in Darwin and we're about to head out to Kakadu National Park. Most people think it's difficult to get around the Northern Territory, but you'd be surprised how accessible this awesome part of the world is. Today we're travelling to Kawinda, which is right in the heart of Kakadu National Park. There's two ways into Kawinda from Darwin. You can go down the main paved highway, or you can take the road less travelled. You can guess which way we went. We have arrived in time for a cruise that will take us on a sunset exploration of the Yellow Water Billabong. What can we hope to see this afternoon? Ah, oh, pretty well every bird you can imagine. Um, ducks, divers, spoonbills, blackneck storks, heaps and heaps of crocodiles, mainly saltwater crocodiles. So we do have freshwater here, but they, they keep a pretty low profile. So the main reason being the big salt crocs eat them pretty quickly, don't they? Yeah, I'm surprised they'd be that close together, mm. yeah. Kakadu is home to an abundance of wildlife. An impressive one third of Australia's bird species are represented here. In the wetlands, we can find around 60 species, from whistling ducks and magpie geese, to eagles, jabiroos, and the famous dancing brolgas. Birds are one of evolution's greatest success stories. They come in a myriad of shapes and colors. So when you're photographing them, try and dissect the bird to create an interesting composition. Maybe just the feathers in the wings, or the shape of the feet, or the neck, or especially the bill, how they feed. If you look more closely at a bird, you'll see that there's so much more to them if you break up the image. I do this all the time, and some of my favourite pictures of birds are actually not of the entire bird. They're actually of a part of the bird. There's a variety of techniques I utilise for photographing birds. Shutter speed is one of those things that I vary depending on the mood of the picture I want to create. If I want to freeze the action, I use a fast shutter speed. But if I'm looking for something more artistic, I use a really slow shutter speed, and then maybe I get the beats of the wings or the movement of the bird. You don't come to the top end of Australia without doing some crocodile spotting. So when you're out croc spotting on the river, what, what are you looking for? How are you finding the crocs yourself? Well, it depends on the time of the day. When that sun first comes up, their, their high priority is to climb up onto the bank and, um, and warm their blood up. And to do that, they'll find a sunny side of the river. So you sort of head to that direction first to, to find a croc out of the water. Mm -hmm. And um, you won't go too far around here and, uh, before you spot one. Yeah. Mm. It's quite depressing sometimes. You'll be out here fishing and catching no fish and uh, you'll see a big crocodile swim past with a 90 centimetre barramundi in his oh. mouth. <laughs> <laughs> What's he got that I don't have? <laughs> We've just come across this large crocodile on the riverbank. And as you can see, he's got his jaws wide open. He's thermoregulating, controlling his body temperature. The great thing is, is that there's all that wonderful yellow in the mouth that contrasts with the teeth and the scales. So that's what we're going to try and translate, get some of that dinosaur-like heritage. Now sometimes when you find wildlife, it's not always going to be in the best position or the best light. So what do you do? Well, you can either take a gamble that you're going to find something else, or you can try and translate that animal in a slightly different way. Now we've got a crocodile here, the sun's quite harsh on the hind quarters and the tail, and the head and the forelimbs are in the shadow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a long lens and I'm going to take close-ups of the scales and the scoots and uh, anything else that I can find that might also tell a story about crocodiles. Now what I've just noticed is that even though the crocodile's head's in the shadow, there's a little ray of light that's just touching his eye. So I'm going to try and get a shot of that part of the croc because it might just be a little bit different to everything else.
With so much to see in Kakadu and such little time, it's important to put down the camera once in a while and spend some time enjoying the scenery. And what amazing scenery there is to enjoy during sunset at Yellow Water, Kakadu. What can I say? This is only our first day in Kakadu and it's been magnificent. I cannot wait to see what happens tomorrow. The selfie has been around since the camera was invented. Well, almost. In 1839, this photo was taken by Robert Cornelius. He set up a camera in the back of his family store and took a one minute exposure of himself. It's now been dubbed the world's first selfie. This might not be what comes to mind when you think of taking a selfie, but let's take a look at how this phenomenon has evolved. When point and shoot cameras appeared on the scene and people started taking selfies, you had to turn the camera around to take the shot. And if it was a film camera, there was a good chance that your selfie would be photobombed. As the digital camera came more into play, it became more difficult to get away with the photobomb. Digital cameras either had a reverse facing camera with real time display, or the shot could be reviewed right after it was taken. Love them or hate them, the selfie stick is a thing now. And for around $10, you can get some great results. Now, you can fit large groups in your shot and are not limited by the length of your arm. The only trade-off for getting a great shot with a selfie stick is looking like a dork in the process. And if you want to take your selfie to the next level, why don't you try the Joby Gorillapod? It will attach to any camera via the bottom screw mount and the legs of the pod attach to virtually any object. The results are a hands-free selfie giving you more room for creativity. Today I'm using the Panasonic Lumix GF7. Now this camera has incredible selfie functionality. Firstly, the GF7 has a 180 degrees flip out screen. And when it's switched to self shot mode, it opens a new world of selfie functionality. Face shutter triggers a shot after you wave your hand in front of your face and body shutter triggers a shot when the camera detects two faces next to each other. There are also two beauty modes ensuring you look your best at all times. And my favourite feature would have to be the jump snap. When used in combination with the Panasonic Image app, the acceleration sensor in your smartphone detects the highest point of a jump and then triggers the camera shutter via Wi-Fi. Pretty cool. Like it or not, the selfie is here to stay. So why not embrace it? I know I have. Hi, I'm Ken Duncan, and this is what's in my kit. First of all, I shoot film and digital. I still love film, wonderful storage device. So when it comes to film, I love my old Linhoff. I name all my cameras. This is called the Hoff for Linhoff. And I have a couple of lenses for this. And I love shooting still with film because it makes you sort of really capture what's there and not get too carried away with what often happens with digital. When it comes to digital, I like phase one because I want detail. For me, when it comes to my fine art work or my limited edition photography, whatever you want to call it, I want as much detail as I can get so that I can do large prints because a large part of our work is big prints. So with this, 80 megapixels and um, I've got a whole range of lenses. Now, something that I also recommend is visible dust. They make these amazing uh, blowers. Now, I know a lot of people use these sort of things, but really all you're doing is circulating dust and actually creating a ionic charge on the dust. So it tends to want to stick to your sensor, whereas this, because it's made out of silicon, is an amazing device and also it filters the air, so you're not blowing more dust onto your sensor. So that's a great thing to have. And then when it comes to just having fun, <laughs> I mean, I'm always having fun taking photos, but I love my little Lumix kit, and I always have this with me. Um, this one's the GX7. I have a, a range of lenses, but basically in a bum bag, this little bum bag here, I can have a whole kit, which will have every lens, which covers in a 35 mil format from 14 mil to 200 millimeters, and I can shoot any assignment just with this camera. In fact, Often you can just shoot shots that you can't shoot on your normal 35mm format or on a phase one. Because it's you're so unobtrusive, it's so quick, and you can take it on the plane with you, shoot out of the plane. And another little thing that I love is 3D. So I carry my little 3D camera because I think 3D is the future. It's still 
trying to get there, but one day it will get there. And I have also a big 3D camera at home. Um, and for me, it's just a personal thing. So when 3D finally does come, I'll already have some of the shots for it. I'm Ken Duncan, and that's what's in my kit. Kakadu is abundant in beautiful landscapes and exotic wildlife, but it's also home to the Aboriginal people who have lived here for over 50,000 years. They are the longest living culture on earth and have a deep spiritual connection to the country. Today we're visiting Norlangi Art Site, where archaeologists have uncovered over 20,000 years of Aboriginal occupation. The Western civilization has such a short history, and to stand in these caves and, and look at this art, it was quite humbling for, for us to see this. Well, here, uh, it's only some areas that haven't been touched yet, so having that rock art on the rock remind us that our uh, male culture is still strong. And the culture has been here for continuously tens of thousands of years. Yeah, I think about 50 to 60 years now. Yeah. yeah so that long. That's a long time, isn't it? Where we are here, this is at what's known as Norlangi Rock, so proper way named Burungoi. We're at, on part of a 1500 metre circuit, so really easy, really accessible circuit for anyone. You've got the Gunratiwati Lookout, so a good lookout. You've got this one's called the Unbungbung Gallery. Then another 100 metres that way, you've got what's called the Incline Gallery, so it's a very large open occupation site with more artwork in it. Then another 300 metres from that is another art site, which has it's only small, but it has huge variance within the artwork. And then 70 metres from that is a massive shelter, a huge rock shelter, which um, has lots of information about it to do with more than 20,000 years of archaeological, re like in the ground there, so of occupation of that. So you've got the art sites, the occupation sites, the big galleries, and it's all on a 1500 metre circuit that my four-year-old kid does, you know. So it's, it's that accessible. I'm a little bit biased, but it's, it's pretty much my favourite part. Because yeah. I do a lot of work here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have your favourites. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> photographing rock art is a lot like photographing a reef. The longer you stay, the more you see. So give yourself some time to really focus on what you're looking at. Try and give the scene context. Try and place the art in its surroundings. Now that might mean using a wide angle lens. And don't be afraid of that. Use that to compose a picture that shows where the people once lived and the habitat that they lived in. Conversely, don't be afraid to get in close and dissect the image using longer lenses. Heads, hands, animals that might be displayed, all of it is fascinating. And the closer you get, the more you'll see. So Tris, you often see these hand images in rock art. Tell me about them. Um, well, the hand stencils, and there's, there's no wonder why they're used throughout the world. You would have seen them all around the world, yeah. hand stencils. Yeah. And it is literally, I was here. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's where it begins at. But once you have, and when you're dealing with the longest continual art history, yeah, there are my ancestors, there are my ancestors, there are my ancestors, there's my great, great ancestors. So. It is one of the oldest forms in the world, as well as in the Australian rock art traditions, but it's one of those ones which is still done today. Yeah. There is no shortage of breathtaking landscapes in Kakadu, and Ubir Lookout is no exception. It's a popular vantage point for getting a great sunset shot, and I can see why. For many people, photographing a sunset is an amazing experience, especially if you capture everything that you hoped but they can also be quite frustrating. Keep in mind that the sun goes down a lot faster than you think it does, so be prepared, get there early and wait it out. The other thing to keep in mind is that your camera will probably underexpose your picture. It will be quite dark, so you might need to use your exposure compensation to lighten the image a little bit. When I'm photographing sunsets, I'm always thinking about what the sun's doing, but more importantly, I'm thinking about where the sun is in my composition. If there's a little bit of cloud in the sky, I'm using that to anchor the sun in the way I compose my pictures. But don't be afraid to break the rules and experiment with where you place the sun and the horizon in your scenes. Look for interesting objects like trees and mountains and rocks or even people. 
After the sun has set, don't pack up your gear and just walk away. Hang around for a bit. You might get God rays that come back up from behind the horizon, and that may be the shot that you're after. What a great way to end out our time in Kakadu, overlooking this grand landscape at sunset and reflecting on the things we've seen, the people we've met, and the things they've taught us about this great country. In the digital age, one of the things that has changed is the way in which we share our images. Social media is great for updating our friends on what we're up to, but it's a very fleeting form of communication. That's right, Jace. I do miss the days where I'd go to the chemist with my film and eagerly wait in anticipation to see how they turned out. Then I'd go home, put them in a family album, and everyone would sit down and take a look. Mm -hmm. Look, I must admit, I still do sit down time and time again and look at the album. So do I. And I think it's a real shame that people aren't printing their images as much as they used to. Well, Jace, there's no reason not to, because Snapfish offers a wide range of ways to print our images. Check out their website. It seems like there's endless possibilities for expression. With prints and enlargements, canvases, glass prints, photo books, Jace. Even fun things like keychains and teddy bears. That's right. Snapfish makes so many fantastic products that make great gift ideas. Think of your holidays and your family moments. This is perfect for those sorts of things. Yeah, like this awesome teddy bear. It's a great gift for a christening. Yep. We've got poster prints here, which would look great in a kid's room. We've also got the keychains and the mug. How about this for Father's Day, Jace? Yep, you can put a picture of the whole family here on the, the cold drinks holder. And we've got these travel books. You can make a travel book, or even if you just have a great weekend and the kids win sport, make a book out of it. And they're really easy to order too. Snapfish has a really simple website with a step-by-step -step order process. And it even has a Snapfish phone app where you can order your prints. It's really simple and easy. So all you have to do, Jace, is you select your photo, you can do it from Instagram or Facebook, add them in, you can edit them, pick what size you like, order, and deliver to your house. Simple as that. Fantastic. I think it's really important to print your digital images, not just for nostalgia's sake, or because it's what we used to do, but it's the best way to preserve the character and emotion that you captured in those images. And they make great gifts too. How about this one, Jace? Well, look. There's a bestseller. <laughs> Our time in Kakadu was far too short and we barely scraped the surface of photographic opportunities. But we couldn't leave the top end without visiting Darwin. It's a hub of food and culture. As the sun sets on Darwin, we find ourselves at the Mindle Beach Markets. This palm-lined boulevard hosts a magnificent pop-up marketplace with a festival type atmosphere. As I walk through the Mindel markets, I'm overwhelmed by the smell of the food. There's a huge variety of cuisine from all over the world. There is something for everyone's particular taste here, from Thai, Sri Lankan, Indian, Chinese, and Malaysian, to Brazilian, Greek, Portuguese, and more. When you're photographing something like the Mindel markets, there's no shortage of subject matter. I was just shooting the guys working in a steaming hot kitchen. Keep in mind, they're there to do a job. So don't get in their way, but try and engage with them. The first shots I took, the guy looked a little scared and I told him that, I showed him the pictures. That's not how he wanted to look and he burst out laughing. The resultant frames were fantastic. Buskers and street performers entertain us as we explore the many stands containing handmade jewelry, clothing and artwork. I've just shot an amazing fire performance. My intent was to capture two types of imagery. One, squeezing the action and the muscles of the performers, and the other, blurring the flames and creating an artistic sense of their performance. How did I do this? To freeze the action, I used a really fast shutter speed, and that meant increasing the ISO sensitivity of my cameras. When I was shooting the slow, more atmospheric imagery, I used a really slow shutter speed. So I used the low ISO and I also used a different aperture, one that let in less light. The Mindel Markets are open Thursday and Sunday evenings. It's a great place to explore and to photograph, but also to relax after a Kakadu adventure. Jace, those five performers were intense. They were, but it was a lot of fun to shoot. So Maddie, what's up next? Next week, I head to the New South Wales Central Coast, meet up with Ken Duncan, the legendary panoramic photographer, and we shoot Sunrise. 
looking forward to it. In the meantime, if you want to keep up to date, head over to snaphappytv.com, join our mailing list for exclusive content, competitions and offers from our partners. See you next week on Snap Happy, the photography show.